Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here today. You are in the right place if you are here for 9.connect's webinar on what you need to know about when routing DDR3. So today's presenter is my good friend and colleague, Sean Kelly. So uh, before he uh, does take over the comm over here, just want to remind you that you have a questions uh, panel within that larger panel that you get with the GoToWebinar. Feel free to ask questions uh, throughout the uh, presentation today. He will have some time today to answer some of those questions. Uh, just uh, please do be specific because unfortunately he won't be able to read those until the end of the uh, webinar when he's going through his Q&A session. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Sean Kelly. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me today um, on this webinar. And let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're going to do is if you haven't already noticed in the email that this is going to be a two-part webinar. And today, I just want to go over an overview of what that webinar is going to be. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about DDR history. And then we're going to look briefly at the comparison between the different DDR types. And then we're going to get into the, really the meat of the subject today, the DDR3 specifics, uh, being the signals and the timing involved. And we're, then we're going to talk about match length versus match delay. Once you understand that concept, then we're going to get into a routing delay dilemma to help you better understand some of the issues dealing with routing DDR3 boards. And then we're going to get into actually delay matching. In part two, which as of right now is supposed to be next month, uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of high speed techniques, serpentines and accordions, uh, signal groups, on die termination, pin swapping, pin delay, via concerns, layout example. Now, we also have um, some real life examples in Altium that we are going to show you and also explain how you can use X signals in that endeavor. So let's talk about the introduction. So DDR has an evolved, but yet it still has quite complicated routing. It is still new to many people and can be quite daunting. When you start looking at DDR3, you're wondering, what is it that I really need to understand? Because DDR3 encompasses quite a bit of information, everything from the, the firmware side to control the memory reading and writing to the actual the memory itself. But you also need to understand what impacts the timing. And then if you're the layout person, what part of routing is critical? So today I want to tie many different concepts together in one cohesive presentation. So much of what we're going to be discussing is a culmination of many data sheets and app notes that we have utilized over the years to become proficient in DDR3. And we're going to talk a little bit about what those things that we've learned. Um, as far as the DDR3 information that we're going to talk about, I'm going to specifically focus more on the signal integrity side and in to include routing concepts. So the first polling question is I'd like to know why are you attending this webinar? It'll help me get a better feeling on maybe why or what I need to add to the next phase of this webinar. Okay, so it looks like about 75% just want a better understanding of DDR. Um, Interesting, 21% think about using DDR3 for the first time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for supporting us. I like that 19% just love 9.connect webinars. Okay, so a little history. So single data rate memory is what started this whole thing. And the concept was that data was clocked once per clock period. But as processors got faster, the DRAM chips did not stay in pace with them. So what was designed was this thing called double data rate. And what it was done is to design it to be able to clock data on both the rising and falling edge of a memory clock. So when you're looking at this signal over here, you can see that both on the rising edge and the falling edge, that is when data is clocked in to the DDR memory. Interesting though, that even though the throughput was doubled, the clock didn't change. And now there's actually DDR4 and DDR5. 
The DDR3 improvements include about a 25 to 30% reduction in power. It also includes a times eight prefetch, a dynamic on die termination, which if you're not familiar with it, it basically removes the need for external termination resistors. And we'll talk a little more about that later on. It also includes an address command and control flyby routing, and we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on that today. And then read and write leveling. We're gonna talk a little bit about the write leveling aspect, driver calibration, and better pinout. Now, better pinout, <clears throat> you may or may not be familiar with some of the things that we've talked about in the past. Uh, a lot of the memory controllers are BGA type devices. And so for years, people had generated these packages with signals coming out in groups, but with no power or grounds anywhere near them. They would cluster all the power and all the ground in one specific area of the package. And what they found out is that created horrendous signal integrity issues. And so as these packages have been developed, they figured out to disperse those power and grounds throughout the signals. So that's one of the things that DDR3 has done better. Now, up until this point, DDR, DDR2, and DDR3 I've listed here, you can see that the basic clock rate has increased. But notice that that voltage has dropped from a 2.5 down to 1.5. And that's where you get your uh, reduction in power consumption. It also allows you faster rise times. You can also see that on dyne termination started in DDR2, but specifically with DDR3, you have dynamic on dye termination. And then flyby routing is something new to DDR3. If you've never done, uh, or if you've only done DDR or DDR2, you're really going to enjoy this new aspect of DDR3. So let's talk about the signals themselves. There are basically two main groups, the data, strobe, and mask, and the address, command, and control group. And what you see here is a SO DIM configuration, which most of you all recognize from like a memory bank in your motherboard and your computer. But you can have that as well as onboard ICs. The other thing I want you to notice before we get into actual uh, signals is the data and strobe down here they are parallel lines that leave the memory controller and go directly to the memory chip. So each byte has got its own path. Now, as we move forward, you're gonna see signals and their abbreviation. So just quickly, DQ is referring to data. DQS refers to the strobe. The data mask is DM, and then the clock is a master clock CK. Notice that the strobe and the master clock are differential signals. The others are just single-ended. Here is a two byte wide SD RAM. And what I did is I just broke out the signals more for reference. So once you've watched this webinar, if you request the PDF of the presentation, you can have some time to study this. But I just gave some information, some general information about the signals themselves uh, to try to help somebody that's new to it get an overview of the signals. We are not going to go into all of these signals. Again, my goal is to help you understand the DDR aspect from routing and signal integrity. Now, DDR2 versus DDR3. Again, if you are if you have experience with DDR2 and one, then that required T branch routing for this address command and control group. So the memory controller had to send the signals out and it basically, all the lines teed out. The problem you have here is you have impedance changes. So if you have a 40 ohm line here and you have 40 ohm here, well then obviously you see that two 40 ohms in parallel give you a 20 ohm. So that's an impedance change which creates reflections. Then you also possibly have time of flight issues. So if you notice, this diagram is symmetrical. You may or may not be able to put your DRAM chips in a symmetrical format on your board. So that can create time of flight and you have to adjust accordingly. If you wanna understand more about why there are problems with the T-branch routing and the impedance changes that 
and what it caused, feel free to look into some Wilkinson power divider theory. So a new aspect that <clears throat> DDR3 adds is flyby routing. Now, with DDR3, you can still use the T-branch routing, especially if you're only using two devices. It, it might make a lot of sense to use that. But this new technique called flyby routing, if you'll notice, yes, I'm showing an SODIM here, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an SODIM. The memory controller is going to send out the command and control lines, and it's going to go to the memory modules in a daisy chain effect. So it can simultaneously go to the left and right on this kind of setup, or in this type of setup, it can start out in byte zero and work its way through byte eight. Now, notice that I've got this blue line coming out here in, in midair, and it's going through the left-hand side of this board. I don't, I'm not trying to imply that the signals don't have to go through the pins. One of the more common pictures you'll see is this blue line might be leaving the middle here, going through the board, and then it comes over here, and then comes down, and then starts with the memory chips. To me, that was a little confusing to show that, so I just want to explain on the front end why I didn't do that. Now, if you'll notice also, you have termination resistors. These are tied to a power supply rail called BTT, and these termination resistors are located right next to the last memory device. So obviously, if we start with the group leaving the memory controller and it gets split and goes to the right and left simultaneously, then you have to have a termination resistor on each end. If you do it in this way, then you only have to have one termination resistor network. Now, we have found that resistor networks perform better in your signal integrity. And what I did is I put a reference here for you all if you are interested in trying to understand more of why resistor networks are better. Now, <clears throat> in the more traditional daisy chain process, um, there's going to be propagation delay as these signals go from chip to chip. And we're going to have to account for that later on, and I'll show you that. But first, let's talk about the impedances. So all the command and address lines are single-ended, meaning that they have a 40-ohm impedance. The differential is 80 ohms. That's for the master clock. The master clock, you notice that because it's differential, you'll see the clock and clock not signals in your diagrams. And that needs a load termination resistor of that 80 ohms. In our termination resistor network here, we show 40 ohm resistors because that's for all the single-ended signals. Let's talk a little bit about the power. The terminations that are made to VTT need a termination regulator. Now, if you remember back in our introduction, we talked about DDR3's power rail is 1.5 volts. Well, that means that our VTT is going to be half of that or 0.75 volts. It is also going to require substantial power delivery capability due to the large number of loads switching at the same, uh, same time. As you think about, you have all these resistors pulling up all these address lines and all the command lines at the same time. So you could possibly have quite a large current draw out of the power supply. The memory itself is also going to need a half voltage, typically referred to as a VREF. And oftentimes, the termination regulator is also going to serve to generate the VREF. A lot of these uh, power regulators have a dual function capability. As the name implies, VREF means that it needs to be stable and have a low noise attribute to it. So look in your memory data sheet for those specifications that are required of your supply. And then lastly, ensure that your power regulator is well decoupled. Now, in part two of our webinar, we're actually going to cover a lot more of the power aspect. In fact, when we do the layout example, Tom is going to show you some of the concepts that you really need to be aware of as you route the power 
and also the decoupling cap placement. So now let's get back to the um, timing with the address command and control group. These requirements can change slightly per manufacturer, so always double check with your data sheets. But some general rules that you can pick up from app notes and that's somewhat consistent from device to device are these common length requirements. So your traces in this group, you don't want to have any length greater than seven inches. In the first memory device, you want to have closer than 5.3 inches. You don't want to have more than 0.75 inches in between your memory devices. And the max distance from the last memory device to the termination, whether it be a resistor or a network, is going to be one inch. Within that, you also need to be aware that there's skew limits. So for the differential clock, typically you don't want more than two picoseconds skew between the positive and negative portion of the, of the clock. Now, if you'll notice here, I put in parentheses some approximations on distances. But I also put a caveat here, if you'll notice there's an asterisk, because distances are gonna be dependent upon the substrate and the transmission line structure. Personally, I don't like to deal with the lengths per se. I like to deal with the time delay involved. And one of the reasons you're gonna see here later on, I'm gonna give you a perfect example of why I always focus on time. Now, with the clocked address commands, you don't wanna have more than 25 picosecond difference between the two. So let's talk about the data mask and strobe group. That was the pink lines. So what you see here on this SODIM is a DDR3 example of a 64-bit system that is grouped into eight subgroups called byte lanes. Each byte lane is gonna consist of eight parallel bidirectional bits and it has its own mask and bit and strobe. So if you'll notice down here in the diagram, you can see that I have in this first memory chip byte zero, DQ zero, DQ seven through DQ seven, and then the strobe zero, DQS zero. And I didn't have enough room on here to make it pretty, but the mask would be DM zero. And then the next chip in the sequence would be the next byte up, would be DQ eight through 15, DQS one, and then DM one. And then just typically will follow suit all the way up to the eighth byte. Now, the, S the SODIMs have gotten quite compact. In fact, now they're quite often 128 bit. So in that case, you would have 16 lanes. Now, the, again, within the data group, the timing requirements can be a little bit different from chip to chip. So just be aware of that. But again, the, there are some common length requirements in app notes that the traces, you don't want to be any longer than five inches. And the lane to lane match needs to be within a half an inch. Now the skew limits in this group, you want from within lane to lane to be no more than 10 picosecond worth of skew. Again, your distances are gonna be dependent on the substrate and transmission line structure. Ultimately, all timing is referenced to that clock signal in the ACC group. But it's important for you to understand that data is not clocked in via the clock, but it's clocked in and out of the DRAM via the strobe. And because the strobe and the clock will take different routing paths, there is an inherent skew between them. If you remember earlier in the picture, the data in the strobe and the mask were in the pink and they went directly to each chip. They had their own path, but yet the clock had the daisy chain from chip to chip. So what the manufacturers did is they came up with this concept called right leveling. The flyby topology has benefits from reducing the number of stubs in their length, but it also causes the flight time skew between that clock and the strobe at every DRAM chip. This is gonna make it difficult for the controller to main all these main specifications of time. So the memory controller can use this right leveling feature 
and feedback from the DDR3 DRAM to adjust the relationship between that strobe and the clock. So when you're looking at this diagram here, so the first two lines, you have your master clock coming from the controller, and then you have the strobe coming to just any one of the DRAMs. You can notice that there is synchronous between um, the leading edge of the strobe and the leading edge of the clock. But the problem is because the, the routing technique is different between the two, then what ends up happening is the strobe is delayed from that original clock rising edge. So what they do is they're going to create subsequent amounts of delay in this strobe from the controller. And it's going to incrementally delay that strobe and test the data lines coming back from the DRAM. And it's going to look for a transition on that data line from the DRAM. Sometimes it's only the LSV, sometimes it's the whole byte that's controlled by the controller. And the goal here is it wants to align the rising edge of the strobe with that of the clock at the DRAM pin per byte lane. So again, because the daisy chain effect of the master clock, the relationship between the leading edge of the clock and the strobe per DRAM is going to be different. So you're going to have a, a skew for DQS0, a different skew for DQS1, so forth and so on. So the memory controller is going to have to create, in this case of our example, we had eight lines, you have eight strobes, it's going to have to have eight different right leveling results, one for each lane. Now before we get into the next um, polling question, just a real brief overview of transmission lines. A microstrip is that situation where your transmission line is outside of the PCB with a reference plane inside. A strip line it has is inside the PCB. So you typically will have two reference planes surrounding your signal plane. Now, if you want to understand more about this particular kind of routing and the issues with that style of routing, then please feel free to contact us about uh, a previous webinar called Give Me Something Real Part 2. And I covered this in depth. I don't have time today to talk about some of the issues with the microstrip, and I covered that in detail then. So with this next polling question, if you were to be given a signal launched into both into an FR4 at a common point in a microstrip and strip line, which is going to get the signal to the load faster? Okay. <clears throat> Oh, good. So we got 58% see that the microstrip is going to get it to the load faster. So for those 36% that voted for C, um, you're going to learn something here pretty soon that hopefully will help you to understand why C is not correct. Okay, so the next concept we're going to get into is match length versus match delay. It's a common misunderstanding and mistake is to focus only on length. The correlation of physical length to time is dependent. So before we get into explaining why that relationships exist, let's do a little review. So the relative permittivity, which is another word for the mathematical word for dielectric constant that most of us all use in day-to-day -day life, that dielectric constant is going to influence your wave propagation speed. A common equation, you can see that there's an inverse relationship between that relative permittivity or dielectric constant and the propagation factor or the velocity propagation. So in a vacuum, speed of light travels at about 11.8 inches per nanosecond. So if you wanted to calculate how much time it actually takes to traverse that inch, it's about 85 picoseconds. But in FR4, let's say the dielectric constant is 4.5, the wave is going to travel only about 47% as fast as it did in free space. That basically means that because it's going slower, it takes a longer amount of time to go through that same inch 
and approximately 180 picoseconds to go that inch. So our problem is, how are we going to determine the actual delay of a transmission line? So let's take a look at three of the most used routing methods. So as a reference, we understand that if a transmission line is in air, again, the relative permittivity, that is epsilon r, is 1. So therefore, the velocity factor is 1. Therefore, the propagation speed is the same as c. There's no delay. In the case number two, let's talk about strip line. In a strip line situation where epsilon r equals 4, then you square root that divided into 1, you get the velocity factor equal 0 0.5, or the propagation is half of the speed of light. It's interesting to know that the delay incurred is basically irrespective of the trace height, the trace width, and the plane to plane distance. It's interesting to note, though, we're going to assume that the width of our plane is three times wider than our signal conductor. In this situation, because it's traveling half as fast as the speed of light, our propagation of our signal is only going to be about 5.54 inches per nanosecond, which is about 180 picoseconds per inch. Also, I want you to note that the speed is not significantly I'm sorry, 170 picoseconds per inch. That speed is not significantly impacted by the symmetry. So <clears throat> before we get into the microstrip, I want to talk about symmetrical versus asymmetrical. In a symmetrical strip line situation, you're going to have something like L3 between L2 and L4. So over here we have a picture. This picture was captured from the ICD software. We have a signal here that's sandwiched between a ground plane here and a ground plane here. This is the ideal situation. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, and this is the ideal situation. The problem is it requires more layers, but you can also use power planes as a reference plane. Just be aware that you have to have stitching capacitors, and of course, you don't want to have broken copper pores and have to uh, route over those breaks. Another option is to use asymmetrical strip line. In this situation, you can save layer count. And what I mean by asymmetrical is, and you'll see this quite a bit actually, here's a plane, here's a signal layer, Here's another signal layer and then a plane. So generally speaking, most of the signal that's propagating on layer six is going to have a reference to layer five. Yes, there is going to be some of the electric field coupled over to eight, but ideally you want to minimize that. So what you want to do is you want to make the separating dielectric at least two times as thick as the other prepregs in this case. In this situation, you can see I actually made it four times as thick. It is also better, the smaller this core is in this situation separating your signal layers, is you're going to want to route basically orthogonal on these two signal layers because that'll minimize your crosstalk. So now let's talk about a microstrip. The velocity factor is not as simple as just one over the relative permittivity, because in this situation, notice the green being your dielectric and the gray over here, that's your air. Your electric fields are going to be going through two different mediums to go between your signal and your reference plane. So therefore, it's not a homogeneous situation. You have to consider what's more considered a, an effective permittivity. The velocity of the wave is going to be faster than a strip line, but slower than if in air. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If part of the field is propagating within a high dielectric constant, then that wants it to slow down. But here in the air, it's wanting to travel the speed of light. So you have to come up with basically an average. So the velocity factor is an equation of 1 over the square root of the effective permittivity. Calculating that is complicated. And I can just tell you from my experience that a lot of these online calculators that you see, your free calculators, 
they can give you quite a variety of different values. Um, some of them are better than others, but anyhow, the main thing I want you to understand at this point is that for a microstrip, the velocity is always faster than a strip line with the same dielectric constant. And routing on the top layer is really a last resort, um, especially if you're trying to maintain these skew limits. And you'll see why later on. As you consider your routes, be aware of the timing skews based upon which transmission line you use. The general rule that most people are going to follow that have a lot of experience in this is to route all your signals on inner layers in a strip line fashion. This is not necessarily due to velocity issues, but mostly for signal integrity. The symmetrical strip line is easier, but requires more layers. The asymmetrical strip line uses less layers, but requires you to keep a thick dielectric between the signal layers. Now for some practical application. So first of all, let me uh, apologize for my artistic capability or lack thereof. What I'm trying to show you here is you have a, basically a microstrip situation here. This is our first round here. You have a part with a ball, a BGA, ball that's landed on that microstrip and it's going through this length to another part. You have a substrate. All the substrates are the same, eight mil thick. And then you can see there's a ground layer right underneath it. So typical microstrip situation here. And I'm going to show you the impact between the microstrip and a strip line in the real world. So before we get started, I want to talk about some assumptions. The ball on the left is basically where we're going to start our signal and it's going to go to the device on the right. The length of this conductor is five inches. The dielectric constant it's, uh, of the material underneath that microstrip is 4.5. And again, all the heights are eight mils. And I've set up a track width of about 20 mils to create a 40 ohm single ended impedance. When you do the calculations, you're going to see that the time of flight being five inches times 155 picoseconds per inch ends up taking about 775 picoseconds to go from this ball to this ball. Now let's change the situation to a 40 ohm strip line. The only changes I'm going to make is basically I'm going to drop a via here and drop a via here. In this situation, length one and five are going to be about 20 mils. This will be something similar to what you all would uh, hear people refer to as a dog bone. Uh, it's used in BGA fan outs uh, because you can get the signals out from underneath the part very easily this way. So that length of our transmission has not changed. Length two and four, two and four are basically the vias themselves that go from the top layer to this signal layer. Because the substrate is eight mils thick, then I basically have added 16 mils total length um, to each from each via. So that ends up being 32 mils longer overall. Now length three, which is the strip line portion here, is still going to be the same length as if it were up here. So it's 4.960. So when you add all this up, the entire length of the transmission line is only 32 mils longer. So keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, by the way, here's a picture of what a dog bone looks like. Basically, this is the BGA pad of your FPGA, and you route it out to your via to drop the signal into an inner layer. In this situation, let's add up the different pieces of the time of flight. So in your dog bone, you have two times that dog bone delay, which ends up being a total of 6.2 picoseconds. And then for the um, vias, we have two times 16 mils, which is the length of the via, plus the strip line L3 times the 180 picoseconds per inch comes up to about 900 picoseconds gives us about 905 picoseconds total. So when you look at that, you can see that the skew is 129.8 picoseconds. So the time of flight 
is 129.8 picoseconds longer in the strip line than it was the microstrip. Now, if you go back to what we started in general guidelines about um, skew limits, remember we talked about the clock to address command skew being limited to 25 picoseconds? But in parentheses, you could see that sometimes you could get away with up to 125 mils worth of different length. Well, okay, so we changed this example by only 32 mils longer by going through the strip line. But this also means that the clock line, if the clock line was on the microstrip, would actually get to our part 129 picoseconds sooner. So you can see a little bit more now why I stay with the timing aspect and stay away from the length aspect. So the third polling question. I'm very interested to find out how many of you all were aware that such a dilemma in length versus time could exist in your routing. Okay, so we got 34% said yes, they were aware, uh, 21 said no, okay, so good. So that 21% is going to really find this presentation helpful. 31% um, somewhat aware but not sure how to calculate it, okay. Well, if that's the case, feel free to, again to contact us. We have quite a bit of webinars that we've done on high-speed routing techniques that cover this type of material. And then D14, um, somewhat aware, but never thought it could be so bad as to be a concern. Yeah, don't feel bad. There's a lot of people out there that who are routing things and they have no clue that it's this, that could be this bad. So where do we go from here? Skew compensation can be done via creating a delay line and serpentine in the microstrip. The best solution possible is to route all your signals, especially within a specific group, inside of the PCB. This is going to reduce skewing issues and thereby minimize the need for serpentines. I give you an example of what a serpentine looks like just in case you've never seen the concept here. And basically, the signal, because it has to traverse a longer distance, makes up that distance. It's also better, by the way, for EMI issues because if you keep your signals inside the board, they're less prone to be, um, radi be uh, prone to radiating out and or picking up signals. So how is, what's the best way to keep up and resolve these skewing issues due to just normal routing? There are generally two ways, uh, spreadsheet and software. Here we have a spreadsheet that uh, some of us use. Uh, because we have quite a bit of experience in Excel and like Excel. Um, if you're looking at the different data lines, we can keep up with the trace lengths and match them. But we also are aware that there's a problem with the effect of dielectric constants because not all material is going to be the same dielectric constant necessarily in a board. So you want to also make sure that you keep up with any variation of that dielectric constant from layer to layer so that you can look at your skew in time. The biggest problem with I see with the spreadsheet is, A, you have to have a good relationship with your board house uh, and a lot of knowledge and stack up before I would feel comfortable doing it with a spreadsheet. Um, and also, a lot of comfort with using Excel if you're creating this on your own from scratch. You know, if you're if you're pressed for time and you're not really that sure of all the different calculations, creating a spreadsheet could be quite daunting and, and uh, intimidating. But then again, how do you know that you haven't made a mistake? And there you've done a spin on a board just to find out, oh, I forgot to keep up with that information. And now the board's a waste. So some of us also use software, and that's what we're going to get into next. The ICD software suite um, is is a nice program, and it can be used for helping with stack up planning, just like we've shown before. 
It can also be used for calculating trace impedances per layer, whether it be single-ended or differential. And it can also be used for calculating time of flight and match. I'm going to give you some practical uh, examples of how to do that. So let me bring this over to the screen so you can see it. So let's go to that example that I showed you before, a four layer example. And again, here we have a signal layer, a strip line, sandwiched between a plane on layer two and layer four. The dielectric constant was 4.5 and the trace width was 40 as a strip line. Uh, trace clearance, uh, sorry, was 20, the trace width was nine. Um, this has a built-in field solver, so it can automatically update these values based upon which material you pick. So for example, if you decide you want a different core material, you just right click, go to edit dielectric, and it pulls up a vast array of materials. And then just whatever material you pick, you just double click on it and it changes it right away. And then it would also change um, the information on the trace width and spacing as appropriate. So let's undo that. The point I want to show you in this one is the matching of lines. So if we use this tool right here, you can see that it shows us the propagation in meters per second. Now, most of us know most boards aren't that big. so it's nice to know, but in real time, it's more important to know what the flight time is. So you click on this plot bar graph, and we said our problem was five inches long. So if I click in five inches, notice that this calculator automatically calculates the flight time. Now again, his this program is going to be more accurate than what I gave you, because I just made some uh, assumptions and didn't deal with the copper thicknesses and all that little bit extra lengths. But you can see that the flight time for the strip line was significantly slower. And the microstrip on layer one was only 783 picoseconds. The nice thing about this tool is all I have to do is hit match delay and it automatically figures out that the flight time to be matched means that I need to go an extra three quarters of an inch on the microstrip. So let's close this. And now, of course, we're dealing with a four layer example. You're thinking, oh, okay, that's not that hard to do. But most of your DDR boards, we have found that you rarely are going to be able to get less than six layers. Most of them are going to be 10 and 12 layers. So here's a typical 12 layer stack up. In this situation, I specifically picked. The fact that this pre this core had a different dielectric constant and this core had a different dielectric constant, just to show you how nice that this program is. Again, if I click on the signal path, flight time calculator, and I do a plot bar graph, and let's say five inches, you can see that actually one of the strip lines is actually faster than the microstrip. Well, why is that? It's because I picked substrates in here that actually have a lower dielectric constant than the microstrip's effective permittivity. And so, again, you may, if you're not really familiar on how to deal with these calculations, this is a great visual representation of what's going on in your board. And again, all you have to do is hit match delay, and immediately you get different lengths for um, compensating for the skew disparity. So the next polling question, polling question number four, given the option of creating a spreadsheet to use versus using a tool like ICD, how necessary do you think such a tool is? Okay, thank you. So basically everybody here seems to think that a spreadsheet is not really the way to go, uh, especially if it's your first time out. Um, I would agree. Um, if you're doing this, you always have to weigh the cost of time 
and possible error. The, the, so, and ease of use of the software tool. So as long as it's cost effective, um, you can get your product out a whole lot faster and less chance of an error. So it's one of the reasons why I like to use it. So in summary, I don't want you to think DDR3 is so bad that you just, it's going to take you forever to try to understand it. It can be conquered using a few rules. But you have to pay attention to the signal skewing and correct for it with serpentines. And again, Tom's going to show you this because in, in the real world, because even though you route everything on uh, a strip line, you still have to make sure that the compensation for the skew from lane to, um, lane to lane is there. So there's still going to be serpentines involved. But you can minimize the probability of problems by routing via strip line. You know, one of the things that uh, let me bring up, I think most of us have done this in the past. If you've got a um, large package, uh, many pins to try and fan out, you fan out all those interior pins as quickly as possible to try to find a way out. And then you use the pins near the outside, the peripheral of that package. And it's tempting to say, oh, yeah, well, this pin on the outside of the package edge, well, that's already on the top, and it's just got to go right over here to this other package. I'll just route it on the top, or I'll just route it on the bottom, because it's straightforward and easy, done. Well, that can really bite you, as you've seen here. Um, the other thing is, I want you to remember to route your clock first, then your address and command signals. And then write your bout, uh, sorry, your byte lanes individually. Most of all, be organized. In part two, again, we're going to talk about the high-speed techniques, some of the things that we can use to minimize uh, EMI issues and increase your signal integrity. We're going to talk about proper serpentines, some of the things that you don't want to do when you're creating a serpentine or accordion. We're going to go a little bit more into on determination again because in the um, address command and control group, remember you had termination resistors. Notice we didn't mention termination resistors in the data group. That's because the on determination removes the need for external and puts that resistor, termination resistor, in the actual memory chip itself. And we're going to talk about grouping, pin swapping, and then the pin delays, that's something that a lot of people don't even consider. And that is that the signals leaving the memory controller don't necessarily all come out at the ball at the same time. We're going to talk a little bit about VIA concerns. And then when Tom takes over, we're going to do a presentation of a real example. And he's going to talk about X signals and Altium. And then the layout, like I said, with the serpentines. Now, I've also put in here some reference material that we have found to be very helpful. Um, this first group is more overall on the routing itself. And then the last two are a little bit more about the technology, technology involved in DDR3, if you want to understand that technology itself. So thank you again for joining me today. Um, before we get into the questions, I would really appreciate you taking the time to rate today's material. Let me know how you felt the presentation met your needs. Great, 91%. Well, thank you all again. So I'm glad I was able to help you all. So let's get to the questions. And while I look at those questions and review them, Paul's going to talk to you for just a minute. All right, thank you very much, Sean, for that wonderful presentation here. So yeah, Sean is going to be looking at those um, the questions panel there. So feel free to. Um, you know, basically put uh, any questions in the questions panel and he'll take a look at those here. While we're giving him a few minutes here, I am going to switch my screen here because I'd like to uh, talk to you about uh, Nine Dot Connects for just a moment here. So hopefully you got something out of this here today. We know that we really do try to put these webinars together for you because we know that there are certain pain points out there. We know that you're here today because DDR3 is a buzzword and for many people it's probably also a very bad word too. But nevertheless, you've seen in your emails, you've seen in articles that reference it, and certainly you know of products that contain it over here as well. So the biggest question is, you know, what's your interest? I mean, a lot of times we see these things like, yeah, that's probably very fascinating. But number one, you may not be sure if you're missing out on the next big thing. 
is it, hey, is this something we got to use right now, or is another technology going to come out later on that might uh, might improve this? Or you know what, you're not maybe sure of the reliable source of information. You know, uh, what was interesting was that when I was talking to Sean prior to the webinar, he was given a really great example of the pictures down here that you see. Uh, for example, because of DDR1, DDR2 having to use those uh, splits, right, the, t the uh, split of the T-line over here, there's a, basically a false assumption that you have to do the exact same thing for DDR3, and which he proved that, no, you don't necessarily have to do that. That's one of the better features or improvements of DDR3. So you have to be very careful about the source of information and in what you're getting this uh, from. You also may not be sure about the level of difficulty. In one sense, like, well, you may have done high-speed design, but there seems to be another level of complexity to DDR3. And you obviously have a right to worry about the risk here because you're investing uh, your time and your energy and ultimately into a manufactured board that uh, may or may not work. So what we want to let you know is that we've actually done DDR3 here. So we've been involved with several projects. And we did ask uh, one of our designers, that was Tom, who you've heard uh, mentioned here several times in the webinar. He's the one who's uh, done a couple of these projects. And he's in turn uh, showing us and teaching us how to do these things as well. But what he found was that if, if you're doing this for the first time, it's probably two to four weeks, and it may even be longer if the board has a lot of tight real estate uh, in it. And when we asked him, say, well, what were the biggest problems or hurdles that you had to deal with? It's this big thing of, again, the timing. It's the inter-signal relationships and their timing. And, in, and more importantly, you've got to take an iterative approach to this. So you can draw it once, but you're going to have to revisit it again thereafter. So what do we have here at 9.connect? So obviously, we have now experience. But the other thing, too, is that we actually also are starting to see some patterns. We also have some reference designs as well. Now, we would love it if we could just package up these reference designs, throw them over to you and say, hey, run with these things. But if you are interested in our reference designs, it really is more of a service because, yes, we, can, we have a starting point to go with. However, no two boards are the same. So things like board size, number of layers, manufacturing rules, board materials, memory product that you're using, transmission line, structure, all of these things come into play, so we have to basically recalculate all the delays again. So if you are interested in that, certainly contact us here. We've certainly got that experience, and we can either, A, do it for you, or more importantly, we can teach you on how to do it. So if you're saying, yeah, this is some cool stuff, I kind of get it, but I don't necessarily want to uh, go, out, go at this alone, we totally understand that, and we can assist you in that way as well. If you want some more information about us, 9.connects.com, go ahead and take a look at that web page. One other thing I'm just going to mention really quick with you is we've also started a blog page as well, so we are slowly but steadily putting um, information uh, out there, and we really do want it to be prevalent and relevant uh, as well. As for part two, uh, that is going to be in February. In particular, it's going to be February 28th, so look for your emails, and we'll make that announcement here in the next uh, week or two. I would love to have you join us here again. So we know we're getting a little past the hour over here. Thank you so much for your precious time. You take care and have a wonderful day.